Um, just check the chat box. Um, I don't know if you can't hear me, then that probably doesn't help anybody. Um, but yeah, this session is being recorded and the audio is being recorded. So if anybody needs to go back and check on anything, you can do that. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, a lot of the equipment that I'm going to be using today comes from mini PCR. They're a great company. Um, very affordable. All of the equipment I got for under, um, I think it was like a thousand bucks for everything that I got. Um, so we have the PCR, we have our centrifuge, uh, we have our gel electrophoresis box. Um, all of my consumables, like our pipette tips and things like that, I got from the Odin. Um, they're a laboratory distribution company um, that sells used lab equipment and then new stuff for things like consumables. Um, I have my pipettes that I got from Mini PCR as well. Um, I only need, I have three different um sizes of pipettes here i only really need to use two of these for most of what we're going to be doing um so i have the 20 microliter to 200 microliter that i'm going to be using a lot and um the smaller one 0.5 microliter to 10 microliter i'll be using the one that goes from 2 to 20 i don't really need that much because this one goes from like 0.5 to 10 and this one goes from 20 to 200 so there's not really much i need to do in between there um if I keep, I store my pipettes in uh, these boxes because I don't have a pipette holder. Um, you just want to make sure you keep your pipettes in a safe space so that nothing happens to the ends. You don't want to damage the end of your pipette. So you don't want to just like leave them out if you're not using them. You don't want any dust to get in there or anything like that. All right, so today what we're gonna be doing is mating type ID, um, which requires PCR um, because there's no real way to look at a fungus microscopically or macroscopically and tell what sex it is basically. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're sexing our parent strains um, that we're gonna be using to breed with. Um, I'll put this mask on to make sure that I'm not breathing anything onto my clean work here. Um, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six samples today that we're gonna run, six um, isolates. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the presentation that's gonna come after the demonstration uh, about how you can get isolates. Um, but yeah, if I, if I did all my work properly, all of these are single ASCO spore cultures. And we'll be able to tell if I messed up and they already mated um, when we do this uh, mating type PCR uh, run. Um, so basically the results that we're looking for is we want, we're gonna, for each, for each of these, we can only do four at a time because I can only run eight samples in my PCR. Uh, that's another reason why I wanna get a bigger PCR than just eight. Um, and the, only re the reason that we can only do four at a time is because we have to test each of these for both potential mating types. Um, so ideally we want only one mating type to show up in our results at the end. Um, if there's two mating types, that means that you messed up with your, um, with your isolations and they already combined with another spore. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen with any of these, but I did get to these a little bit late. So they potentially, uh, might have already made it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and spray my hands down with some isopropyl alcohol. I have a bag of centrifuge tubes here that come sterilized um, and you want to do your best to keep these clean. So I only open it in front of the flow hood and just take what I need. So I need eight of these. I mean, I only need four of these, sorry. Um, I need four of these for my samples. I need two of these to mix my prime, to dilute my primers. And I need two of them to make my primer mixes with master mix, uh, which we'll talk about as we go.
I hope that they're single spore isolates. So somebody asked in, uh, in the chat box, you mentioned that these are all single spore isolates, so how could they have already made it? Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the presentation, but um, I have to pull these spores out of a dish with a bunch of other spores in them. So um, occasionally they might have already connected before I pulled them out. Um, so that part requires a little bit of dexterity and you have to do it under the microscope. So every now and then you'll make a mistake. Um, but I'd say I have about 90% success rate. It's not often that I mess up, but I did leave these a little bit longer than I, than I uh, usually would. So they, there is a potential, more potential that these already made it. Um, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, I have a blank Petri dish here. I usually use water agar for this. Um, but this petri dish is just for me to cool off my scalpel. I'm going to need to sterilize my scalpel between um, pulling out mycelium so that I can kill the mycelium so that I don't accidentally breed these with each other and I don't cross contaminate it. Um, I have my pestles here. Um, these are going to be used to grind the specimen. Um, I have these in a 10% bleach dilution, um, and I just I usually pull these out a little bit ahead of time so they can dry out in front of the flow hood. Just gonna set these on some petri dishes to uh, to dry off because you don't want to put bleach in your in your samples. So ideally, these would have already been dried off. So I'm just going to let them sit over there and dry up a little bit. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start getting, preparing our samples. So I have my first Petri dish here. I'm going to spray the outside with isopropyl alcohol. And I'm going to pull off the parafilm around the outside of it. Just throw this away. There's no use. There's no sense in reusing it. It'll probably contaminate what you're working with. All right, I have a scalpel here, and the blade is a little bit dull, so I'm going to take this blade off and put a new one on. And I'm going to sterilize this in the back disintegrator over here. Um, this back disintegrator is uh, high heat. Um, and it's just going to kill off any bacteria or anything like that on there. I'm going to go ahead and open my first centrifuge tube here. And this doesn't need to be in there that long at all. You'll start, you'll start melting the blade. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and cool this down in my clean Petri dish. And I'm going to go in here and I like to do this from the edge and cut two lines. Um, I'll show you up close. And kind of make it like a rectangle. So you can see, it might be a little bit hard to see, but I cut like a little rectangle on the edge. And what you're going to want to do is gently scrape the top. You want to get a little bit of the agar so you don't like destroy the mycelium, but you don't want too much agar because it can mess up your reaction. So there, I have a little piece. I didn't dig up the whole agar with it. Just a really tiny top layer of mycelium and a little bit of agar. I'm going to go ahead and drop that right into the tube and close it. You don't want these tubes open if they don't need to be open. So you can see there's a little piece of the mycelium in there. I have a little um, a little ceramic coaster over here um, that I can set my hot tools on so they don't burn my, my table. And um, now that I have this sample, I'm going to uh, cover it back up with parafilm. And I'm going to mark this. So 
first thing I'm going to cover back up with parafilm, the edges. And because I sprayed alcohol on it, I need to wipe it off a little bit so I can write on this. I'll just keep this paper towel to use it again a couple times. And um, I'll take my Sharpie here and I'll mark this number one. And then on this uh, centrifuge tube, I'll mark it number one. Um, so for the rest of these, I'm not going to show you up close because moving it around outside of the Petri dish is potential to get contamination, um, which isn't the biggest deal with this. Um, because the primers that I'm going to be using to isolate the mating type genes only work for this mushroom. Um, there aren't any other bacteria or anything that can contaminate this that will that these primers will, will, will work for. The genes are the gene that the primers select is specific to Cordyceps militaris. So I'll set this one to the side. I'll take the next one. I'll spray the outside with isopropyl alcohol and then repeat the steps. Um, for anybody that's interested in reading more about this, um, if you have a subscription to Fungi Magazine, I wrote an article on this for the, the issue that came out um, this winter. Um, so the winter issue, it's like 2019, 2020 winter issue of, Fun of Fungi Magazine. Um, I, I wrote all about this. And then if you wanna read a little bit more um, just look up cordyceps breed, uh, breeding online and uh, there's an article from or there's a research paper from Korea um, that goes into this in detail. Um, somebody asked to repeat what I just mentioned about the primers and what are the primers. Um, all right, so the primers that I'm using are matte primers. Um, I got I got the primer sequence from the research paper from Korea. Um, sorry. Primers are the beginning, and like a couple letters of the beginning and a couple letters of the end of a specific gene. Um, and they whenever you're running your PCR, they bind to the end of those genes, and that's where the copying will start and end. Um, it kind of guides the PCR re reaction. It kind of guides where the um, where the free uh, bases are going to connect to the DNA. Um, so the primers that I'm using are specific for Cordyceps militaris uh, mating type one 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 and one two one. And I'll I'll put the sequences. I'll email you guys the sequences, so you can get them synthesized. There's no there's nowhere that I found that um, there's nowhere that I found that sells these primers already mixed for you guys. So you're gonna have to order them from any laboratory company that um, that can synthesize DNA for you. And they're typically gonna come ten times too strong for a reaction, so you're gonna to have to dilute it, which we'll do um, during this demonstration. Um, so now that I did that one, I'm gonna clean this off, and I'm gonna write number two on here. This is the second one, I'm gonna put number two on here so I can keep track of everything. And for those of you that don't know, I'm not classically trained in molecular biology, so, um, I find this to be beneficial for other people that aren't classically trained in molecular biology because I can explain it in kind of layman's terms. Um, but I might say some things that are not um, exactly the correct thing, but it works. So that's what's important. I'm gonna sterilize this scalpel one more time, cool it down. If you don't cool down your scalpel, you'll kill your mycelium and, you, and you'll damage the DNA. So you're not going to get a good read off of it.
mark that number three. And I'm on to the last one now. When you're breeding a lot, this takes a long time if you have a small PCR. So um, definitely check out the Odin because uh, they sell used PCR sometimes and you can get a bigger one. Um, there's some that can hold up to 100 reactions at a time, which would be great. So I wouldn't have to do this so many times. Um, but if I get another one that has 16, then I have another eight, then I can do way more at a time. If you're doing a lot of breeding projects, you're going to end up doing a lot of this. Do cordyceps inbreed mutate if you breed ASCO spores from the same strain into itself? Yes. That's why we started doing this. Um, when I first started growing cordyceps, I was only inbreeding them. Uh, Multi-spore in intra-strain, so intra means with itself and inter means with another uh, another specimen. So I was only doing multi-spore inter-strain or intra-strain. And um, the first generation won't have any mutations, but, but the second through the fourth inbred strain will start to have mutations. Um, and they'll have deformed fruit bodies and stuff like that. Just like any other organism, if you inbreed it too much, it's gonna get genetic diseases. All right, so this is number four. All right, I'm gonna set these off to the side. And the next thing I'm gonna do is get my extraction solution. Um, which I have a video on my YouTube that shows how to make extraction and dilution solution. Um, so I'm gonna go get that out of the fridge. So you can order extraction solution from different laboratory uh, supply websites fairly cheap, as well as the dilution solution. Um, but if you're on Facebook, definitely join the fungal sequencing group. And um, Alan Rockefeller posted a recipe on there for making extraction solution and dilution solution at home. Um, and it's fairly simple. Um, and for a lot of the work that you're gonna be doing, with molecular biology, um, you should order molecular biology grade water. Um, but I found Aquafina to work really, really well, and I think it's kind of funny. Um, but if you're going to be running any things with Aquafina, you make sure that you get a new bottle, because um, once you open it, then it's potentially going to be contaminated with something. Also, um, you're going to want to order these syringe filters that you can see here. Um, for some things that are more sensitive, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you syringe, you, you filter, sterilize the water. So I'll get like a, a 60 milliliter syringe and fill it up with water and put a syringe filter on the end of it. And then I'll use this and squirt it into my different um, tubes and, and from my mixes and things like that. And I found this to work really well. Um, and I've never needed to buy molecular biology grade water and I have good reactions. Um, I would buy it if, if I had more funding, but I'm doing this all by myself. So Aquafina really works really well. Um, you're gonna get good results. Just make sure that it's for each run, you have an unopened bottle. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go with 100 microliters of the extraction solution. So this is very basic. Distilled water will work. You want like distilled reverse osmosis. Like you want it to be as pure as it possibly can be. Like don't use spring water or anything like that. You don't want a lot of minerals or anything like that in it either. Um, so I'm gonna take my 
my pipette. Might be hard for you to see because the light's behind. Um, but there's a little knob on your pipettes right here. Some of them you can just do this. You can do this with this one too, just twist the top. Um, but you're gonna wanna turn it to 100. All right, so I have it exactly at 100. And I'm gonna put a pipette tip on it. And these pipette tips go up to 200 microliters. The pipette tip needs to stay very clean. You don't wanna stick a dirty pipette tip into anything that you're gonna be reusing. Um, you, gotta, you gotta learn a little bit of etiquette with this. Um, because I don't need to stick this directly into my tubes, I can use this same pipette tip for all of these tubes. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to give this a light little mix and go in here. And with the pipette, there's two levels to how hard you can push it down. You can push it down a little bit and it'll, you'll feel it have some pressure and that's the first stop. And if you push it further, that's the second stop. When you're pulling liquid up into this to put into something else, go to the first stop to draw off the liquid. Then slowly release. If you, re if you stick this into some liquid and you just let go of the pipette, uh, uh, the little plunger part on here, if you let go of it without slowly releasing, it'll shoot liquid up into the pipette. So you have to release it very, very slowly. And then without sticking this into the tube, I'm just going to squirt this liquid in and go to the second stop. That'll get all the liquid out. So again, I go to the first stop, pull up my extraction solution slowly, release it to the second stop, into the next tube. First stop, pull it up slowly, release into the third tube, to the last stop, second stop, go to the first stop, Pull it up slow and then put it in there to the second stop. And on the end of the pipette, there's another button right there. And if you press it, it'll eject the tip off. So you can see, I'll just do this for you demonstration right here. You see the tip just popped right off. Um, I usually have like my trash can next to me so I can just pop the tips off over there. Um, some people keep like a little lab trash thing on their table so they can pop the tips off in there. Um, so I'm going to close all these except for the first one. I'm going to take my little I'm going to take my uh, pestle here and I'm going to grind this into the extraction liquid. So because this is just mycelium on agar, it'll grind really, really easily. So I'll just do this for like 10 seconds. Make sure you just mash it up. You want all the cells to break open so the DNA will come out into the extraction liquid. And then I just take a paper towel and wipe off my tips of my pestle and then put it back into a bleach solution to kill off the DNA from it so I can use it again later. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get this hot really quickly. I, I don't have one tool that I really would like to have, um, which is a heat block. Um, after you extract your DNA into the tube, um, after you extract your DNA into the tube, heating it up to 95 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes can increase your success rate of this process up to 20%. It's not necessary, but a 20% increase of success is a really good increase of success especially when you just do this sometimes and it doesn't work at all. What are you grinding into the extraction liquid, somebody says. The little piece of mycelium that I put into this tube, I'm grinding it up and I'm mashing it up. Um, and what happens is the cells will break open into the extraction liquid and um, then the DNA will be in the liquid. And because, yeah, 95 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. And because, um, because I'm getting it so hot, the agar will melt. And this is why you don't want a lot of agar in this, in this solution, because it'll melt and solidify during this process.
what are you putting where for 10 minutes? Um, I'm going to put these tubes with the, with the mycelium in the extraction solution um, onto some source of heat that can get up to 95 Celsius for 10 minutes. Um, so in a standard laboratory, you'll have a heat block that's specifically for heating up these centrifuge tubes. It kind of looks like this, except it's like metal. You can stick your tubes in there and it'll heat it up. Um, I don't have one of those. So typically what I do is I'll put it in, um, I'll put it in water. Or I'll put it in a little jar and I'll put it in boiling water. Um, but I have a magnetic stir bar that I got from Biotech Without Borders and um, it, it heats up. It doesn't get like all the way to 95 degrees Celsius, but it still increases my chances of success with this. But um, with the magnetic stir bar, I can't put the centrifuge tube directly on it or they'll melt. Like the plastic will melt. And these, these centrifuge tubes are meant to be heated up. So it gets so hot that it melts this plastic that's supposed to be able to get hot. Um, so I have a little jar around here somewhere. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, where did I put that thing? I'll be right back in one second. Just hang tight, everybody. Here, I'll put this music back on. I'll be back in like one second. <laughs> Going through the change, I'm back where I want to be. I'm not coming home. All right, and I'm back. All right, so I just have a glass jar. This is definitely like citizen science at its best. I just sprayed out this glass jar um, with isopropyl alcohol. I'm gonna take this little piece of uh, paper towel and stick it in there so the tubes stay upright. If you have a heat block, definitely use your heat block. If you can invest in a heat block, it's definitely worth the investment. Um, you also need to be careful because when these get hot, they might pop open. Um, so try your best to avoid that. All right, so my magnetic stir bar is right over here. It's hot. Um, Right now it's at 53 degrees Celsius. It's gonna just keep getting hotter. So I'm gonna set these on here and slowly that's gonna get hot. Um, so that's gonna take a little bit of time. Um, so what we're gonna do in the meantime is we're gonna get started on the presentation. And as we're going, I'm going to um, keep monitoring the temperature on there. And as soon as it gets like near 95 degrees Celsius, I'm gonna start counting for 10 minutes. Um, I'm only using the magnetic stir, stir bar for, to heat this up right now because I don't wanna keep running up and down because um, I have my stove upstairs that I will usually do this on, which can definitely get to 95 degrees Celsius if, if you put this jar and like a glass into a pot of boiling water, it works way faster than the magnetic stir bar does. Um, it's been difficult to get isopropyl alcohol. Can you use food grade peroxide? Um, I don't recommend using peroxide. I use alcohol because it evaporates really quickly. I don't want to have perox wet, my hands wet for a long time. Um, I've never heard of PCR, so I have to backfill some research on this. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I mean, I taught myself how to do PCR in like a month, so you can definitely figure it out. It's not too hard. There's a lot of YouTube videos and stuff. All right, so we're going to get into this presentation. Um, we're probably going to do part of it right now. 
and then part of it later when we start running the PCR. Um, and because the PCR runs for so long, um, we're going to end today's presentation with the PCR. And then um, I only posted this on social media, so I'm guessing most of you guys follow me on social media. I'll post the results on social media and I'll send an email out to you guys on how to read the results. Um, but yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll do 10 minutes of this presentation right now and then we'll continue with the rest when we get to the PCR section. All righty. Okay, guys. I really, again, I really appreciate everybody joining in on this. So yeah, we'll get into this. Breeding Cordyceps militaris. All right, so an overview on breeding. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, drop them in there in the chat box. I can see the chat box while we're doing this presentation as well. Um, so an overview. Um, number one on what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to find parent cultures. We need to get our spores from somewhere. So we have to start out with a wild mushroom or a mushroom that we grew, um, but you need to have a cordyceps fruiting body to start. So you need to find a parent. Um, the second thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to isolate spores from the parent culture. Um, so we'll talk about how we can isolate spores from a fruiting body once we have a fruiting body. The third thing we're gonna to need to do is determine mating types of the isolated spores. So we need to figure out basically what the sex is. Is it a boy or is it a girl? Fungi are way more complex than just being boy and girl. Some have thousands of mating types, um, but luckily with Cordyceps militaris, there's two mating type locusts on the DNA of Cordyceps mushrooms. And each one of those mating locusts is known as MAT1. It has one mating type. The other one is known as MAT2. It has two mating types. Um, the MAT1 can only mate with MAT2. Even though there's two mating types on MAT2, they can't mate with each other. They can only, either one of those can only mate with the MAT1 to produce fertile offspring. Um, so that means if you wanna have mushrooms that are capable of reproducing spores, you need to have one mating type from each of the mating type locus. Um, next, after you know what the mating type is, you combine the opposite mating type. So you combine MAT1 with MAT2 to breed a fertile offspring and have a new strain that's capable of producing mushrooms. Um, the fifth thing that you're gonna to need to do is test new strains. Um, so once you've bred out your strains, you're gonna to wanna to te to to test them. Because even though you did the selective breeding, it doesn't mean that you have good genetics. Um, it could still be kind of lame genetics that aren't that great, um, that produce really low yields. So you need to make sure that you've bred off good genetics. Um, number six, Note the traits of your offspring. Um, so I keep a, I don't know if you guys can still see my camera right now, um, but if you can, I keep track of all of my breeding pairs in the notebook. Um, so this way, whenever I fruit them out, I can see what the two parent isolates are. Um, and I keep all of, my, all of my isolates once I confirm what the mating type is. I keep them upside down in my refrigerator. Um, and this keeps water from building up on them and it also preserves them a little bit longer. Um, but every time I fruit them, I go back and I see, here, I'll just show you guys. I'll stop this share for a second. Um, I'll show you guys, or I'll, I'll, uh, I write in my notebook and you can see which one is bred with which one. So I'm like, I'll go back after I fruit them and I'll say, oh, hey, this one, um, this mat two KSM mat two is um, all of my strains that are bred out with KSM mat two has long stroma or dark colored stroma, and everything that's bred out with my mat one that I called Slay um, has high yields or something. You're gonna notice different traits that are common with different uh, parent isolates. Um, so I keep track of all that so I can see which parents are producing the best offspring and I can then make the best parents together to produce 
desirable traits. Um, I have a naming system, which I recommend you all develop some sort of naming system. And I'm encouraging everybody end their naming system with either M1 or M2. I put M1 for all my MAT1 mating types, and I put M2 for all my MAT2 mating types. Um, so I have one strain that, one isolate that I called Slay. Um, so I have Slay M1, which just means that's my Slay isolate, and it's a mating type one. I have uh, some isolates that I called MMC, um, which I called it, I named it that for mushrooms, minerals, and crystals, or um, and coffee because my friend found that and that's his, his Instagram handle. Usually I name them um, based off of where I found them or some defining feature of it. So um, I'll just abbreviate the state forest where I found it or I'll um, put like a color or something de definitive about the stroma and I'll just use letters. I'm not gonna write a whole thing. Slay is my only strain that I have that I wrote out a whole thing for it. Um, and then, and then I put out like a little code in my notebook that tells me what all the individual letters stand for. Um, so everybody can figure out what the heck, how they want to name their strains. But I definitely recommend if you have your mating types confirmed, just end it with M1 or M2. So that'll be like something universally that everybody knows. If it ends with M1, it's a mating type one. If it ends with M2, it's mating type two. Um, all right, so my jar is at 95 degrees Celsius right now. And I'm starting my timer for 10 minutes. Hey Siri, start 10 minutes. Your timer is set for 10 minutes. God loves Siri. All right, so um, after you note the traits of your offspring, then you're gonna go back and combine isolated spores with desirable traits. So now that you know like this one is doing this and that one is doing that, um, and I want these traits, then you can start breeding them together. One of the one of these, uh, just like I mentioned earlier, you're gonna wanna be careful that none of them pop open. One of them popped open because it got too hot, building up steam. Um, so I need to close that really quick. My apologies. This is what happens when you're doing DIY science and you gotta make do with what you got. It, it also helps when they're straight up and down. If they fall down and they're on their side when they're in, when they're in your little jar for heating them up, they're gonna pop open a little bit easier. All right, so note the traits of your offspring and then um, go back and combine the ones with desirable traits and then the end is just repeat, do it over again. How long is one's culture of vitality? Somebody asks, um, cordyceps is a nest faster than most fungi and most mushroom producing fungi. So typically um, from the time that you breed your strain, it'll last about a year. Um, some only last nine months and that's why we go out and find new genetics all the time and breed all the time. No, um, 95 degrees Celsius, it won't damage the DNA. It'll help it go into solution, but if you do get hotter, it can start to damage the DNA. So 95 degrees Celsius is just where you wanna be. Um, I, don't, the, I don't care about the pressure buildup. If you have a heat block, you, you'll have something that can hold the caps down. All right, so finding a parent strain. Um, I'll start out talking about the wild. I hope everybody can see my, my presentation uh, right now. But yeah, um, in Pennsylvania, we're really lucky because a lot of the forests, well, a lot of the forests that aren't damaged too much, the ones that are older are, the, are a really good habitat for, for cordyceps. Um, depending on where you are in the country, you might not have older growth forest, um, which sucks, but that's just the reality of, of this day and age, um, especially in the East Coast because um, the East Coast has been deforested so many times. Um, there's not a lot of places that has old growth. Um, and our old growth is still not even that old. It's like 100 years old maybe at the most, maybe 200 years old at the most. Um, I don't know many forests that are that old. Um, but what we're looking for when we go in the wild are um, mixed oak and hemlock forests. You want there to be both oak and hemlock in the forest. 
Um, you want there to be running water, so either springs or creeks. Um, and you want moss and you want dry creek beds. So you, so mountainous areas with oak and hemlock are probably the best because a lot of, on the mountains, there's a lot of places when it rains too much that it turns into a, a creek just for drainage. That's the, like the best, you want that. You wanna be able to see where the water runs through but it's not always there. Um, and then you're gonna keep your eyes open and look out for little orange specks in the, in the moss. Um, they'll be little sticking up, like smaller than a pinky finger, sometimes the size of a pinky finger. And uh, when you find them, you don't want to just pull the mushroom up. You want the whole thing. Um, so this is one of the habitats that we'll find them in. You see there's a creek moving there. There's running water. You see there's hemlocks, little oaks, some, some rhododendron. Um, this really perfect habitat. When is cordyceps season? Cordyceps season starts late May and ends in October in Pennsylvania. Um, so sometimes you'll find them in the moss. More typically, you'll find them in the moss. Sometimes you'll find them in leaf litter. And occasionally, you'll find them in sticks, like in old rotten logs and in coming out of sticks and stuff. The insects bury themselves in like rotten wood or bury themselves in the soil to pupate. And then the cordyceps takes over their body, wiggles them a little bit more to the surface, and then it pops out a mushroom. Often with Cordyceps militaris, the bug will be pretty close to the top. Um, with other Hypocreals order mushrooms like Topocladium, it doesn't care how deep its host is, it'll just grow all the way up through, but Cordyceps militaris doesn't do that. The host will typically be fairly close to the surface. Um, and then we just pull back the moss a little bit or use our fingers to dig around um, the, the soil. Sometimes I'll use a knife and I'll cut a, a little circle around the cordyceps mushroom and then gently remove the dirt and remove the moss to expose the insect. Um, I typically carry around a tackle box with me um, that we can put the cordyceps in specimen individually into. You want to make sure that they're separate because if you're going to be collecting spores from them, if you have two cordyceps, in the same container, they're gonna cross spores in there, um, which may not be ideal. And you don't want them to cross contaminate at all. Make sure you remove as much dirt as you can. If you have like a small paint paintbrush um, or like a toothbrush, soft bristle toothbrush or something, you can use that to um, brush off some of the dirt from the insect. If the insect is broken, do not take the insect into your lab. Just take the fruiting body in your lab. The insects that we're finding are typically Lepidiopterian pupa. Cordyceps militaris are the most successful cordyceps mushroom because they can, they can uh, grow on over 50 different species of insects. Previously, we thought it was only 32 different species from the research that was available. Um, but when I looked further into that research, I realized that all the insect species that they had listed were, uh, were only found in Asia, except for one, Anisota senatoria, senatoria which uh, is an insect it's the oak worm moth, and it is na it's also native to Pennsylvania. Um, so that's one of the species that we have identified. We're still working on identifying the other ones. Typically, we only find them on Lepidiopterian hosts, um, but my friend Jeff uh, found them on, on a wasp once, uh, or, or, or two times he found them on a wasp. Um, and occasionally, we'll find them on beetle, beetle grubs. Um, some questions. Why do you want the whole insect again? There's mycelium in the insect. You can clone from the insect if you want to take clones. Also, you can make tea with the insect and you can get beneficial um, compounds out of that. Um, I'm not, I, I'm mostly only cultivating cordyceps militaris. I grow other mushrooms for myself. Somebody asked a question about that. Um, but yeah, if the insect shell, if the shell of the host is broken, the exoskeleton or the shell is broken, then it probably means that there's mites inside of it. Mites help move cordyceps mycelium through the soil. Um, but if you get mites in your lab, it sucks. It's like getting an STD or something. It's hard to get rid of it. And if you, sell, if you give your cultures, if you're selling cultures or sharing, sharing cultures with anybody else, you're going to give them mites. Um, the first time I got mites, I got them from somebody else. Um, but if you bring in broken cordyceps, if broken insect hosts into your lab, there's going to be mites in there. And mites are microscopic little things that look like ticks that eat mycelium off of your petri dishes. So you don't want that. So don't bring broken hosts into your lab. If it's broken, just bring only the fruiting body. 
Um, so typically what I do from, from wild is I'll clone it, which is way more tedious and takes more time and not everybody needs to do this. My friend Ryan Gates from Terrestrial Fungi, he just takes spores from the wild specimen. This is a great way to go about it because it, it reduces a lot of time. But the reason that I take clones is because I, fe I personally feel, and this isn't scientific proven, scientifically proven, but I feel like if I take a clone and it's capable of fruiting in vitro, like in culture, then the offspring are probably gonna have better, uh, better success rates with being cultivated inside. Um, about half and sometimes more than half of all wild clones will not fruit at all. And that's why I do that. Um, any ones that will fruit, I feel like will be a little bit more successful, but this isn't scientifically proven. It's just something I like to do. Um, if you don't want to waste all your time with cloning and doing all that, then just take spores off of the wild specimen. If you don't live in an area where you can find wild cordyceps mushrooms, um, definitely, I definitely recommend um, utilizing terrestrial fungi to get strains if you want to breed, um, or utilizing Appalachian gold, or utilizing uh, myself. Currently, we are the only three people that are publicly posting that we're breeding cordyceps mushrooms. Most other people that are selling cordyceps mushrooms on their culture supply websites have bought cultures from us and are selling them at a cheaper price and they're, they're degrading. Um, every time you split your cordyceps culture off into a new petri dish or to a new liquid culture, it's gonna be degraded. But because we're breeding them, we can always go back to the original petri dish that we bred out so you're getting the freshest cultures from terrestrial fungi, from Appalachian gold, and from mycosymbiotics. So I definitely recommend utilizing us if you're going to be um, getting parent strains online. Um, so my timer just went off, so I'm going to pause this um, presentation, and we're going to get back to that in a moment. Um, my timer just went off, so these have been at 95 degrees Celsius, and they actually did get up to 95 degrees Celsius um, for 10 minutes. I'm gonna put my mask back on here. Take a sip of water. And spray my hands down because I'll touch my computer. And I'm just gonna dump these out onto the table. So they're all heated up and you'll notice that some of the agar is starting to melt a little bit, which is okay. And the next step is to take some of your 200 microliter pipette tips, attach your pipette tip to your um, pipette that's set to 100 microliters. And you're going to add the same amount of dilution solution as you did extraction solution. So I'm going to add 100 microliters of dilution solution. Again, like I said, um, because you're not sticking these directly into the centrifuge tube, you can use the same pipette tip for this step. Go to the first stop, draw up your liquid, do it slowly, release it to the second stop. Again, don't touch the tubes. You will cross contaminate if you touch the tubes. If I touched the tube and went back into my dilution solution with a little bit of this mycelium on my tube, I will contaminate my entire dilution solution and I will have contaminated success for, or contaminated results for any other any other thing I use after this. So because of that, some people will just take their dilution solution and put it in another container um, and then just use it out of another container for each run. Um, I don't really find that to be necessary. All right, so I added 100 microliters of dilution solution into each of these tubes. I'm gonna close them. And I'm gonna shake it up. So each of them just give it a nice shake so everything gets distributed. If you wanna get fancy, um, you can get a vortexer. And this helps get everything shaken up. I got this vortexer on eBay. It works really well. 
Um, basically what this does is it just shakes everything up into solution. So I just put it on there and I don't know if you can see, but it starts spinning it and everything's all mixed up. The next step is to take your centrifuge and plug it in. I have a really big centrifuge under my table here that I can use for bigger runs. But since this is only four, I don't really need to use my big centrifuge. And open up your centrifuge, turn it on, and put these in here. Make sure they're opposite of each other. It just keeps your centrifuge balanced. Like you don't, if I was only gonna run two, I don't want them to be right next to each other because this one side will be a little heavier. So just make sure that they're on opposite sides of each other. And make sure that the little hinge is facing outward. And close it up. I'm turning, oops, I didn't mean to start that. I'm turning it up to 12,000, or it's 12 times 1,000 uh, RPMs. And I'm gonna do that for four minutes. Hey Siri, put a timer on for So yeah, I'll just let this run for four minutes. So I'll put, I'll put the music back on for you. I'll answer any questions, if anybody has any questions while this is running in the chat box.
to my life. I know you hear this classic Neptune's production. Cuban Link. All right, so my timer just went off. I just stopped the centrifuge. Um, so the reason that we put it through the centrifuge is to separate the little bit of agar and um, mycelium from the, the liquid that has the DNA extract in it. So you can see there's like a little pellet at the bottom that we don't want that mixing in with the liquid. We want only that liquid. That liquid has the DNA in solution. You only need one microliter of this stuff per reaction. I'm just gonna double check my notes here. Sorry, I'm just running through my notes really quick just to make sure everything's proper. Okay. So what we need to do now, and you can do this uh, ahead of time, is just do the math on uh, your reactions. Which I have in my notebook. All right, so I don't know if you guys can even read that here, but we're doing four samples at a 25 microliter reaction. That's what we're gonna be doing in the um, PCR tubes. They're smaller, they fit into the PCR. They're um, a little bit smaller than, than the centrifuge tubes. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to do four times 25, uh, which is 100. Um, so the total reaction volume is going to be 100 microliters and then divide that by two and it'll give you how much master mix you should put in. So I only need 50, 50 microliters of master mix for four, for four reactions. Um, actually, I'm doing the math wrong. So my, my apologies if anybody started writing that down. I'm going to be doing eight samples because I have to do two for each of these. Um, so eight samples out of 25 microliter reaction is 200. Uh, the total reaction volume is going to be 200 microliters divided by two. That'll tell you how much master mix you need to use. Um, master mix has the blank letters for the um, for it has the the blank uh, bases for the DNA. So it has the um, ACTG, which will bind with the opposing side of the DNA that you're trying to copy. Um, that's what the master mix is for. Um, and then you're going to add water. Um, so the water volume equals 200 minus the 100 for the um, master mix minus eight, minus eight, eight and eight um, for the forward and reverse primers. Um, so at the end, I'm gonna need 76 microliters of water, um, 100 
microliters of master mix, eight microliters of forward primer, and eight microliters of reverse primer. So that's what I need in total. Um, my apologies, I suck at math really bad. Um, that's what you need in total, but because we're gonna do four of each, you just cut that in half. So I should have just went with four like I was saying at the beginning. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. Um, so in total, we're doing eight reactions, but we're doing four with the mate, mate, mat one primers, and we're doing four with mat two primers. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare our primers. This is the way the primers come to you. Um, I get these synthesized from IDT DNA. Um, I'll, like I said before, I'll email you guys the sequence that you can send to IDT DNA, IDT DNA to synthesize these for you. So I have MAT 111F, MAT 111R. So they come to you like this and they're 10 times too strong for the reaction. They'll completely mess up your reaction at this concentration. So you need to dilute these. And then we have MAT 121F and 121R. The, the F and the R stands for forward and reverse. All right, since we, since we don't need that much of these, I'm only gonna dilute them. They're 10 times diluted, so I can, I can put one microliter to 10 microliters of water. With the smaller pipettes, it does half numbers too. So just make sure the half numbers are blue on mine. So just make sure the half number is at zero if you want it just to be one. That's set at one. I got my smaller pipette tips here. I have my empty tubes. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the mat one forward. I'm gonna take one microliter. And you really don't wanna mess up and get these contaminated because that'll mess up a lot. Again, go to the first stop. Draw up some liquid and drop that on the side. It's literally just a tiny drop. Like it's a tenth of a drop, I think. So dispose of that tip, get your next tip. Go to your next one. Draw up one. I like to put it on the side when I'm doing such a little bit, a little amount, just so I can see it. And now I'm gonna do my MAC2 primers. Start with F. Take that to the side. Remove that tip. So that's all we need of those. Take these and put these back. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this all the way up to 10. And I'm going to take 10 microliters of my clean water and put it into each of these. You can't do nine. I just choose to do 10. This stuff is really, really concentrated. And this is just to dilute them because they're too concentrated. New pipette tip for each one.
And I'm going to grab my Vortex here to mix them all up. This will get all the drops off the side. Click it a couple times if you need to. And then do it again. And I twist it around, make sure everything gets mixed up. You want to make sure it's in solution. If the drop of the primer is still on the side, that can really just mess everything up. Be sure to make sure you're not wasting your time. I would just centrifuge it for like a couple seconds. And this will really make sure everything's together. Um, so before I put them in the centrifuge, I'm going to label them 1F, 1R, 2F, 2R. You can see like there's still a couple droplets on the side. I want all that to be down at the bottom. Since it's such a small amount, like one of those droplets could be the whole primer. I'm gonna turn this to top speed and literally just turn it on for like, like 20 seconds. That'll just force everything to the bottom. Now there's nothing on the sides anymore. Everything's on the bottom. It's just literally a tiny bit of liquid. That's all you need. So one thing I like to do because it's not too expensive, everything that I'm using, except the master mix is a little expensive, but I like to just make double the amount that I need for this. So I'll need two more centrifuge tubes to make the mixes. One tube for mat one, one tube for mat two. And I don't buy, I don't buy racks for my PCR tubes. You don't really need it. Um, you can either just put your PCR tubes directly in your PCR when you're about to run it. Or you can, um, whenever, you run, whenever you run out of the uh, 10 microliter tips, um, you can just use this to hold your PCR tubes instead of buying like a whole rack for it. But I'm just gonna do it right into the PCR. Um, so the way that I do it is that the, from this side, from the hinge, that's my number one, because it's really hard to write on the tips of these mini PCR tubes or the PCR tubes. So I just always remember that this is number one and then this is number eight. So figure out the best way to organize this for yourself. That's what works for me. I'm going to get these in here first before I make my mix, because you kind of want to move fast after you mix the master mix with the primers and everything because it's going to start the reaction. Set this aside. I'll put this behind my rack here. Um, I'm going to close these and just label it. I don't really need to because I can remember, but I'm just going to put one and two on this. Just 
lay my hands down just because it's like a habit at this point. And I get my master mix from um, the Odin. That's the company I mentioned before that sells laboratory uh, supplies. This is what you want. You want 2X TAC Master Mix. TAC polymerase. So it has the polymerase in there. And they give you a nice full centrifuge tube of Master Mix. Pretty affordable for, for what it is. Um, so I need 100 microliters of Master Mix for each. Um, that's for eight sample reaction. I really could use 50, but I like to just go a little heavy handed. I'll attach my tube or my, my pipette tip. Put a hundred microliters in each. But if you're, if you're really concerned about how much you're spending on this, just make sure you just do the exact amount. So again, just like I mentioned, you only need 50 per four reactions. So now I added that and I'm gonna add 76 microliters of water into each of those. And now I'm gonna add eight forward and eight reverse into each of those. But at this point, you need to make sure that you're only putting the mat one primers with the mat one um, tube and only the mat two primers with the mat two tube. You don't wanna mix mat two primers with the mat one primers. And I'm doing eight of each. It's okay to mix the mat one primers with each other and the forward and reverse, that's what you need to do. Do not mix the mat two primers with your mat one primers. All right, now make sure you got this all mixed up. I just give it a flick. There's enough liquid in there that it can mix up with itself. You don't need to do all the centrifuging and everything like that. Just flick and the water will like, the liquid will jump all around in there. It'll get itself all nice and mixed up. Now, what you need to do is take your smaller pipette and turn it to one. So the way I organize this, just like I mentioned before, is that from the hinge, that's my number one, and the one on the very end is my number eight. So starting at number five will be, number one and number five will be my first sample, mat one and mat two. So number one will be my first sample with mat one primers. Number five will be my, my first sample with mat two primers. Number two in here will be my number two with mat one primers and number six will be my number two with mat two primers. Number three will be my number three and so on and so forth. So what I'll do, I switch my 
my smaller pipette to one microliter. And when you draw up liquid from these, remember that you don't want the pellet at the bottom, so just stick your pipette tip in at the top to pull liquid out. And you can use the same pipette tip for both because you didn't add the primers in the PCR tube yet. So I got one microliter. And then again, take another one microliter and put it in number five. Change your pipette tip. Take your number two sample. Put it in number two. And then again, in number six. New pipette tip, number three sample. Number three, again, number seven. And then number four. Goes to number four and number eight. All right, so I set this up for a 25 microliter reaction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, pipette tip and I'm gonna change it to 25, or the bigger pipette, I'm gonna change to 25, use the big pipette tips. And then I'll take my number one mix with master mix and uh, mat one primers. And I'll take 25 and put it in the first four. So 25 goes into number one. Eject after each one if you stick it in the tube. Um, you don't necessarily need to stick it in tube, but I did it on accident with that one. If you cover it above the tube, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to change the tips, but it's really hard with these small ones. So I'm just going to do that. three and number four and I ended up with some left over um, and you're not going to want to use that again because it already started reacting now I'm moving on to um, mat two so I'm going to start out with number five Number six. Number seven. And number eight. All right, now one by one, I'm gonna take this out, close it, and just flick it just a couple times, stick it back in and do that for each one. Make sure you put them back in the right spot so don't take out more than one at a time. So you'll keep track of everything. If you really want to get one of the smaller um, Sharpies, like the fine tip Sharpies and mark them if you feel like you might get confused. But I, don't, I, I haven't gotten confused yet with this.
All right, so now all of those are ready to go. Now I want to get this PCR running. So I just close my PCR. I gently tighten the top. And crap. Um, I need a piece for my computer. I have these new, I have the new MacBook that doesn't have USB on it anymore. So I need a little adapter. I'll be right back. I'll play some music for you guys. Sorry about that. Still time lies instrumental. Shout out complexion. I want to welcome you to my world. Today we have my brother, my partner, my day one OG. Selection's very home, Andre Power. It's been a cool minute since we've had him on the show. And it was only right. We've been working on so many projects for Selection. And now that we have the time to slow down, we're not on tour, home all day. This is the time to work on what we truly love. Andre's gonna be stepping up the second hour. So stay tuned for that. Music-wise, had to kick off the show with Aga John. All right, stupid little USB adapter thing for these new MacBooks. All right, so I'll plug in that thing. And then there's a USB to USB that goes in the back of the PCR. This is to program the PCR so it knows what it's supposed to do. And then, oops, I'm gonna unplug that. Because it can turn on off just the USB power. I want it to be powered on its own. So I'm gonna plug this in. And if you're gonna be running it off your computer, just make sure your computer's charged and like plugged into the wall or something, because it'll just run off your computer. And when you turn it on, if you, if you were running other programs on your PCR, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you change it to your Mac PCR. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna screen share what I'm doing. All right, so this is the mini PCR program and it's running fungal PCR right now, which I don't want it to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to map PCR, which I already pre-programmed and I'm gonna hit run. It's gonna say, you, do you wanna stop fungal PCR? Yes. Um, with the mini PCR, because it can run without the computer, you need the computer to program it what to do, but because it will run without the computer, when you plug it in and you turn it on, it's gonna run the last program that you had. So all these different programs tell it tells it what to do. So you can see on this map PCR, um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna, uh, the initial denaturation of the DNA is gonna go to 95 Celsius for 60 seconds. So for one minute, it's gonna heat up to 95 degrees Celsius. Then the denaturation is gonna be 95 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds. It's going to anneal for 58, at 58 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds. Then it's gonna jump to 72 degrees Celsius for 40 seconds for the extension. And all of those processes, what happens is the DNA that we put in there is gonna split apart. The three letters from the master mix are gonna match up with their opposing letters on the DNA that split apart. And then it's going to come back together and you're gonna have one copy. So by the end of this, which is probably gonna take like an hour, which we're not gonna follow through to the end of this because that's too long, but I'll, I'll keep you guys updated. You can see the initial, initial denaturation, it finally reached the temperature. So the DNA is splitting apart right now. It's gonna do this until I have 3 billion copies of these genes. Um, once I have all those copies of these genes, I can run gel electrophoresis to see my, like visualize my results. Um, so what I'll do, um, since we're not gonna follow through for the entire thing, is I'll record how I make gel, um, agarose gel for my electrophoresis and I'll record all that and I'll just put it on YouTube so everybody can see it. Um, and then I'll post the results on, on Instagram so you can see what, what the heck's going on. I already have a video on my Matt PCR where I talk about the results on my YouTube channel, which is Apex Grower, if anybody wants to check that out afterwards. Um, so now that the PCR is running, I'm gonna plug my computer in because live streaming and running PCR off my computer is gonna use all my battery. Um, so I just plug my computer in. 
and I'm going to share the rest of the presentation with you guys. Um, if you guys just want to drop in the chat box, I have a lot going on. So I just want to make sure, can everybody see my presentation right now? This is in my new book. This is also in the last issue of Fungi Magazine. Um, and it's in my book. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, and this was recorded. This whole session's recorded. So if anybody's missing out on anything, you can rewatch this. There's a lot of people that signed up didn't make it on here tonight. Um, so it's recorded for everybody. So if anybody can just let me know in the chat box, can you see my presentation before I start again? Yes, yes, all right, cool. All right, so we were talking about parent strains. And again, just like I mentioned, Ryan Gates from Terrestrial Fungi, Jeff from Appalachian Gold, and myself are the only people that are that we know of that are breeding out strains and everybody else that's selling fruiting cordyceps strains got them from us and they're going to be more degraded so these are the reputable sources that i recommend right now yeah i'll send the recording to everybody afterwards i might just post it on youtube for people um yeah i'll, I'll probably just put it on youtube on a private link for a while for everybody that donated and then i'll make it public later um, all right, so here we go. Uh, from is isolating spores from parent strains. So what, once you have a wild specimen or if you have a um, cultivated specimen, if you have a wild specimen, I recommend a little bit of a different approach. Um, maybe get deeper Petri dishes because wild specimens will probably have other contaminants on them. Um, you can get deeper p Petri dishes to keep this, this sample away from the agar uh, but you're going to want to use vaseline or wax or waxoline which is like a beeswax alternative to vaseline um, to stick your fruiting body to the top of the petri dish and you're going to leave that there for maybe like 10 hours um, you'll start to see the spores um, visibly without a microscope you'll see like some stuff on the on the top of the agar um, it'll just look like it's a little wet or something. You'll, you'll just notice it like, maybe like it looks like kind of dusty. Um, so depending on how active the, the fruiting body is, it might drop spores in just like a couple hours. Um, but sometimes it takes like a whole 24 hours. So I usually just check on it every couple hours because you don't want a lot of spores to drop on there. The more spores that drop on the agar, the harder it's going to be to isolate those spores from each other. And if you're lucky, it's going to be ejecting spores like crazy, and some of the spores will end up on the end of the dishes. Um, sometimes with wild strains, you can um, stick them to the top of a mason jar, like a small, like, like I think it's like two or four ounce mason jar, and let the spores drop in there. But it's a little bit harder with bigger containers because the static electricity will make the spores fly to the edges. Um, so I really like doing it with the agar. Um, once you have spores on your agar, you can do one of two things. Um, you can either look under the microscope, find a single spore and pull it out with a scalpel, which is kind of hard, but that's what I do. Or you can do serial dilutions. Um, so some people will just have them drop spores into like a little glass container and shake it up with distilled water and then dilute it multiple times into sterile water and sterile water and sterile water until there's like not a lot of spores. Um, or you can just do it um, by making a grid on a clean Petri dish and you're gonna wanna use water agar for this. Um, sorry if you hear that fan, it's the PCR running. It's going to be kind of loud. Um, so you're going to want to do water agar. It's literally just one liter of water and 25 grams of agar. You don't want a lot of nutrients in this because it'll make the spores grow out faster and you want them to grow slow so you can separate them. Um, so what I did with this is I'll turn the Petri dish over and I'll draw a grid on the bottom. And then I'll take distilled 
ster I'll sterilize distilled water in a jar in the pit in a pressure cooker. And I, I just do that for 30 minutes at, at like 15 PSI. Um, and then take your, take your pipette, um, change it to like 50 microliters or like hundred microliter. First go like hundred or, or 200 microliters and squirt all of that water onto the spores on the Petri dish. And then kind of just like shake your Petri dish around and then switch it down to like 10 microliters and suck up that water off the top and then put one little drip of water in each part of the grid and then take your take your petri dish that you put all those drops of water on and put it in front of your flow hood without putting any parafilm around it and this will cause the clean air from the from the hepa filter will go will go into your petri dish and it'll dry up the liquid the drops of liquid that you put on there once the drops are dried up, then put it under the microscope and you'll easily be able to see the edges of your grid lines on the microscope. And then you can look inside each grid and see how many spores are in the squares on the grid. Um, once you see, if you look in there and there's like 50 spores in there, then you're gonna need to dilute that again. So I'll take like 10 microliters of sterile water, squirt it into that dried up spot with like 50 spores and then um, take it out and then drip a little bit into another Petri dish with a different grid. And then you're just going to keep doing that until you look in the microscope and there's just one spore. This takes so long and it's so annoying. Um, but some people prefer cereal dilutions. Um, but one thing that I noticed that happens with cereal dilutions is that the spores will become fragmented. They'll break, um, which, can which can decrease the viability. So what I recommend the most is just to... Um, once you have spores dropped on the, on the Petri dish, look around the edge of the Petri dish with your microscope and try and find a single spore. So the single spores on the side will look like what you see here. It's easier to see the spores if you, if you take, take the fruit body out and then um, close the lid on the Petri dish, wrap it up with parafilm and then leave it for another day and the spores will germinate. Then it's easier to see them in the microscope because there'll be a little bit of mycelium coming off of them. So search around your petri dish and try and find one that is really far away from the other spores and it didn't the mycelium's not connected to anything else and then pull out like like underneath the microscope look until you see your scalpel under the microscope and then pull the little one spore out and put it on a clean petri dish if you're lucky you'll get one spore hopefully um, if you notice that like on the left you can see fruiting bodies coming out obviously that's not a single spore single spores won't produce fruiting bodies so I, threw, I got rid of that one. Um, sometimes I'll put multiples on one dish just to save Petri dishes. Um, but as soon as they start growing out, separate them so they don't breed with each other. Eventually you'll have a whole bunch of single ascospores. This table full of ascospores is probably the result of like six hours of me sitting down here looking in a microscope and pulling single spores out of, out of a Petri dish. So it is kind of tedious. Um, determining mating types. So we went through all the process of how to do PCR for mating types. The PCR is running right now. Um, once the PCR is done running, you'll mix your product with a little bit of gel and you'll put it into an agarose, um, which again, just like I said, I'll record myself doing this and post it on YouTube for you guys. Um, I have, my scope is a mic Microlux. Just get any kind of compound microscope. Um, they all, if they have, they all should have similar magnifications if you get a compound. Um, I don't really have any scope recommendations though. I got this from a college auction. Um, so on the left, we have the gel um, results and you're going to want to get a ladder. Um, a DNA ladder is what I have on the very right. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but the very last well on the, on the picture on the left has a bunch of little yellow lines in it. The furthest yellow line is 100 base pairs. The second one's 200 base pairs. Third one up is 300 base pairs. Fourth one's 400 base pairs and 500 base pairs. The mat one, I think, is like 200 or like 300 base pairs, and mat two is closer to 500. So you can tell which mating type it is. I use 2% agarose gel. Um, you can tell which mating type it is by how close it is to whatever base pair is on the on the ladder. Um, so again, that's information that I'll send you and I'll put in the YouTube video. 
Um, I can't remember what base pairs they are off the top of my head. Um, but you can tell if they're different because one will go lower than the other one. So what I what I do when I get the results is um, for the first sample, I'll put the mat one and mat two in the wells next to each other. So if if the first two wells give me results, then that means that it already made it. Only one of them for each two samples should have a result if you if it's a single mating type. You'll notice that there's clear bands at the bottom on on the samples that don't have any results. That's just the primer because the prime because there wasn't anything for the primer to bind with because it wasn't mat two or mat one. You'll only see the primers in the gel. Um, but again, I'll make a YouTube video explaining this a little bit more detail. Once you know what the uh, uh, opposite mating types are, then you can take a little piece of mycelium from each of the uh, mating type isolates and combine them on a Petri dish. So I'll take a little cut of mycelium out of my mating type one, stick it on a Petri dish, take a little cut out of my mating type two, stick it on the Petri dish. And then within the next two to three days, the mycelium will find each other and they'll breed on the Petri dish. Then you need to test your new strains. So I test my strains in pint jars. Over the past couple months, I haven't been cultivating anything at scale for a commercial scale because I've just been testing everything. And everybody keeps asking me, why do I still grow in pint jars? It's because that's how I test my strains. Um, pint jars are reliable, they're sterile, um, and they're small. If I'm testing a strain, I don't want to have a bunch of substrate um, more than I need because it might not fruit or it might yield really low. So I test all my strains in, in pint jars. Um, and then I note the traits of my offspring. So whenever I'm, whenever I get results, whenever they're finally fruited all the way out, um, what I'll do is I'll take a picture of, I'll pop the specimen, I'll pop the cordyceps specimen out of its jar. I'll put it on the table and I'll put the lid next to it. The lid has a code for which strain that is. So this one was D15 and I'll go back to my notebook and look what was D15. So D15 was my... R1XKG1. Um, so I'm like, all right, this strain is nice. This strain has pretty decent sized stromata. They're not super tall, but they're pretty decently sized. It yielded me about three and a half, four grams dry um, on average from all the ones that I ran. It produces parathesium before the stromata is as tall as I want it to be. It has a nice color and it's resistant to parasitism. Um, so that's a lot of nice results that I have from this one. So this next one, D4. Hmm, I really like the length of the stroma on this one. Um, I like how this, the parathesium are only produced on the top of the mushroom, but it didn't fill out all the way. The yield is not going to be as high on this one because there's a lot of empty space in there where there's no mushrooms. So I'll go back to my notes. D4 was pgm one xsvm 2 So... What I'll, try and, what I'll try and figure out is for those parent isolates, which one of those isolates is providing this strain with the tall stroma? It's gonna be one of the isolates. It's either the mating type two or the mating type one. One of those has the genes for tall stroma. So I'll have to look at all the other ones I've read with those individual parents and see which ones have common traits. D11, I really, really like this one, but it was really short. So that was uh, PGM1, dash three x svm two dash two so this one has the same parent this one has the same mate mat type two parent as this one so obviously it's not the mat two that's making these have long stroma it's the mat one on this one that's making it have long stroma this one has really short stroma it's a really deep orange and it has the same trait for the mat two svm two two that this that the parathesium are only on the top sometimes you'll get cordyceps where the parathesium are on the whole stroma um, but you can see this one only has parathesium on the top of the stroma and the bottom is just naked. I really, really like that feature. And that's from the SVM22. So you can see that here, the bottoms don't have parathesium, it's the top two. So that's a trait of my SVM22. This one I really like, this is D2. This is SVM1 X SVM2-2. So again, you'll get that trait from the 2-2, um, SVM2-2 that has the parathesium on the top, but not on the bottom, which I really, really like. And then this shows me that my SVM1 has really, really tall stroma. So I'm like, all right, I really want the tall stroma. I could, I, I could care less about the, the um, if, I, I would rather have tall stroma with parathesium on the whole thing. That doesn't matter to me. I just rather have the tall stroma. 
So I would choose the SBM1 parent and try and breed it with something that, of the MAT type 2 that has long stroma. Um, you can see these two also have the same, <clears throat> have, have one of the same parents, but you can see that they're very different in pigmentation. So I really like the dark color on this one, which again, that was my um, D11. So it got its color from its MAT1 parent, which was PGM1-3. Um, and this one, I can't remember what the parents were on that one. I don't have it, uh, the picture to reference. Um, but you can see they have one of the same parents and completely different color. So these are all different things that you want to note. What are the common traits between your different uh, parent isolate strains so that you can pick which ones you want to breed with each other down the line. Um, so those were all the ones I harvested from one of my last breeding trials. I think I did this, I harvested these in like February. Um, so there were a bunch of different genetics and that's why I grow, I grow in jars. I grow in jars just for testing my genetics. So now that I, now that I find all the ones, I found all the ones that I like, I go back to the drawing board and I breed out the parents that I like. And I, and if I need to do commercial cultivation, I'll take out the best producing ones. Like this one is one of my best producers. And this one was one of my best producers. So I put those two for commercial cultivation just to make me some money while I'm doing my more breeding trials. And I go back and mix the parents that I like. Somebody says, do you also do HPLC on these? I wish, I can't afford to do HPLC. I can't buy a, a liquid chromatography machine. I don't have enough money for that. Um, if I did, or if I knew some college students that could do all of that kind of stuff, then I could send it to them. Like I wish I could do HPLC. Even third party labs, I can't afford that. I, I work for myself and I just teach people stuff. Like I did this donation based and like, I teach people stuff because I want people to learn. Um, and some people were very generous with their donations and also some people gave whatever they could, which I'm not upset about, but I don't make a lot of money doing this. So I can't afford to do all the research that I want to do all the time, um, which I'm always open for donations. And if anybody wants to help me do an, uh, an analytical uh, research then go for it. Or if you want to help me write a grant so I can do analytical research, go for it. Cause that would be something really good to look at. So aside from looking at visual features, morphological features, um, if I was able to do HPLC on these, I could say these two parent strains are producing the most cordycepin or the most cordimin or the most adenosine. Then you can start breeding for compounds instead of visual aesthetic. This is when you can breed for compounds, then you can just grow liquid culture mycelium and just produce for compounds. Because you can grow, comp if you're just harvesting compounds, you don't need to make fruiting bodies. You can just use the mycelium, it's way faster. Which kind of research would you want to do with HPLC? I just want to, I just want to test to see what, how, how, what levels of compounds are being produced by breeding different strains. Um, all right, we'll continue here. So once you're done with all that, go back and combine isolated spores with desirable traits. So you can see this one, this thing's almost red. Like that's insane. So I really, really like this red color. So what I did um, is I back crossed it. So again, you don't wanna do multiple generations of inbreeding or crossing with itself, but back crossing can, like back crossing it with its parent or breeding it back to itself can increase the desirable traits that you see in it. So because this is red and I really like it, I bred it back with itself and I'm breeding it back, I'm breeding it back with itself and I'm breeding it back with its parents to try and get more of this red color out of it. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what we just did the mat testing on is the spores from this one. Um, so whenever I have really fat stroma, I cut them in half and then I stick it to the top of the Petri dish and get spores over again. Um, so I really appreciate all you guys joining in today. Um, for anybody that did already pre-order my new book, it's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. We're going to get it printed in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you did pre-order it, I really appreciate it. You helped me fund it. So again, thank you guys. Um, thank you everybody for joining in today and donating to the cause. All of your donations help the research that I'm doing. Um, helps me to figure out more stuff like this so I can teach more cool classes. Um, if anybody wants to donate any more for um, trying to save up money so I can do field genomics this year, um, you can always go back to the PayPal link and just drop a donation whenever you feel like it. I would really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for joining in. Um, definitely follow me on Instagram if you haven't already. Um, stay tuned to my Instagram and my Facebook. I will post the YouTube link um, for how to read the results from what we did today. Um, also, 
um, just stay stay tuned on your email. I will send you an, uh, an email with all the other information and the link to this video um, if you need to rewatch this and check anything out. Um, so I really appreciate all you guys for keeping me afloat during this quarantine and, and supporting my research. I hope you guys can take this information you learned today um, and do something amazing with it. Um, I'm really excited to see what other kind of strains that everybody starts breeding. Um, and as always, you know, propagate and myceliate. Release heat. Now he's playing a bunch of joints as well by a producer named Elko at G Funk Modern Funk Sound. He also goes by Main Green Maid. And then put a bunch of joints from my bro, Clefto. It'll be sprinkling some tunes, a bunch of edits. Shout out to my guy Gold Hands once again. Let's get to this music. Make sure you keep it locked. Bring us my selection family. Thank you.